the mercy train. The moon, like a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. William Shakespeare. Midnight, midwinter, New York City. An ice shard moon slit the hard, dark sky, while mean cold sliced through the seams of my thick woolen coat and weaseled through the pores of my leather gloves. I'd spent the evening in the university library, and now, racing against clock and arctic air, pressing book bag to chest, I ran to board the subway. The red line. It stretched from Harlem through the city's upper west side where I went to graduate school and down toward the lower east side where I lived in a bedraggled walk-up apartment that offered me little comfort as I wrestled with the loss of my first husband. As I sat down, my eyes began to burn with the sudden switch from night's bitter wind to the warm, stale air in the brightly lit train. Like all New York subways, the red line usually carries a thousand themes of humanity, but not at this late hour. Tonight, in this particular car, it carried just one man and me. The train had screeched through a half dozen stops before I really took notice of him, slumped over in a seat kitty corner to me. He wore a cumbersome gray-blue coat ventilated with a dozen holes, belted with rags. Legs sprawled, head hanging forward, a mass of woolly black hair hiding his face. His right arm clutched two bulky bags, propped it beside him and cushioning him like kind old ladies. The other arm hung limp between his knees, long thick fingers dangling wearily. Safety pins secured the seams of his thin green trousers, trousers that hung short of bare ankles, swollen and chapped by winter air. Tie shoes, lacking laces and too big in size, encased his sockless feet. My heart went out to this survivor, who had apparently come to the subway for heat and rest, and who was now, almost contentedly, sucking wisps of warm air into his throat. As I listened to his low snore, I wondered what sort of jolt in life's journey had brought him here. Although I couldn't see his face, I recognized something about this man, as if we'd met, perhaps in what were better times for both of us. I saw in him a heart-rending magnification of my own struggle to survive the harsher chapters of life. I marveled at his durability. Clearly, his tribulations were seismic compared to mine. I tried to imagine what it was like to seek solace in a subway. I don't know how long I stared at him, but suddenly I became aware that the train was approaching my stop. I looked at his pathetic shoes and then down at my own booted feet, knowing that under those boots was a layer of jeans and under those jeans a double padding of wool socks. Socks had never seemed so important as they did at that moment. My mind raced to figure out if there was time to remove my boots, yank off my socks, offer them to the man, and pull both boots back on before the subway reached my destination. I had scarcely completed this thought when the conductor hit the brakes. Feeling a strange desperation to offer something to a man who had asked for nothing, I reached into my coat pocket and retrieved its contents, two dollars. It's not enough, I thought. But the train had come to a halt, so I got up hastily, pushed the bills deep into one of the man's bags, and, apparently unnoticed by him, scooted off the train just as its doors were closing. In the days that followed, I occasionally thought about the man, wondered about the face behind all that hair, and imagined him shuffling through his bag and happening upon the money. Would he see it as a small token of compassion, or as no more than a means of returning to the subway for a couple of more nights? When, whether, and what to give are questions everyone in New York has to contend with, no matter where in that city of contrast one abides. I know one fellow who tore the want ads out of the newspaper each morning and folded them into his breast pocket. 
Sometimes, when approached for handouts on his way to or from work, he would invite the solicitor to a cafe and offer to help them hunt the ads for work. Nearly everyone rejected his offer, but occasionally someone accepted. Once someone even got a job. But this fellow is rare. Most of us pass by extended hands like priests and Levites on the road to Jericho. One builds up defenses in a big city and develops self-survival blinders that are not easily penetrated. The needs of people can be so desperate, so constant, that one closes her eyes because she imagines that to open them is to be overwhelmed or irrevocably obligated, or both. One day, while walking down 2nd Avenue in my old neighborhood, I saw ahead of me a stream of people detouring around something on the sidewalk. When I reached the detour, I discovered they were all avoiding a body sprawled on the pavement. I, too, walked around the figure. For the next two blocks and all the way up my apartment steps, I thought about that man. I took off my coat and hung it up, chiding myself with the question, how much effort would it have taken to hoist the fellow up and sit with him in a corner cafe over a warm drink? Then I sat down on the couch and tried to read. It was useless. I put my coat back on, ran down the steps, and hurried to the place where I'd passed the man. But he was gone. Had he pulled himself up? Had someone with more courage and heart than I happened by? My friend with his want ads? Two weeks after encountering the man who'd been sleeping on the train, I again turned into an Upper West Side subway entrance to ride the red line on its late night run. Glancing down the stairwell, I spotted a figure crowned with a mass of woolly black hair. He wore a cumbersome gray-blue coat held together with a belt of rags. I called hello to that familiar coat, and the man inside it looked up, revealing his face. The face, as much as the coat, seemed familiar, for I saw in it all the ups and downs of the human experience. Without thinking, I bounded down the steps as if an old friend waited for me at the bottom. I walked up to the man, and I heard myself ask, Do you need money for the train? Startled, he responded by opening his palm to show me a handful of pennies and nickels. I don't need all of it. I already have 15 cents, he told me. Responding to the strength as well as the struggle in that outstretched hand, I gave him the rest of the fare. Then he, with that face I somehow knew, gave me a crescent moon smile that made me the debtor.